welcome everyone. Um, I am very happy to be able to uh, introduce our panelists for today. The session is Dickinson, Shakespeare and the Archive, Research and Teaching in the Digital Age. And this panel, I hope, will give us an opportunity to think about how digital materials and approaches to teaching have transformed our classrooms at every level. Uh, and for those of you who have been following us, um, EDIS has now started a hashtag Dickinson live series. And I'm very happy to say that Ivy was um, one of our, um, I believe, four presenters um, this spring. The other three were Rene Berglund, um, Antoine Cazé, and Edelberto Muller. So for those of you who are interested and wish to present uh, on, on digital or other uh, regarding Dickinson, please let us know. But we're using that platform as a way to really, uh, again, enhance our communication. Um, we have two scholars with us today who are deeply informed about digital approaches uh, to teaching and the archive, and will be sharing those insights with us uh, and how they bring together these two extraordinary writers um, using these platforms. So I will go ahead and, and introduce them now, and then we'll um, invite them to make their presentations in um, the order in which I present them. Ivy Schweitzer is Professor of English and Creative Writing and past Chair of Women's and Gender and Sexuality Studies at Dartmouth College. Her fields are early American literature, American poetry, women's literature, gender and cultural studies, public and digital humanities. Most recently, she is the editor of the Occam Circle, a digital edition of works by and about Samson Occam, and co-producer of a full-length documentary film entitled It's Criminal, A Tale of Prison and Privilege, based on the courses she co-teaches in and about jails. And I'm sure you're familiar with her, uh, her blog, The White Heat, which she, in 2018, she began um, weekly blogging about the year 1862 in the creative life of Emily Dickinson. This year, um, she, she has also uh, co-edited a collection of, of essays in honor of Occam entitled After Lives of the Indigenous Archives. This year, she collaborated with three colleagues in the creation of a digital pedagogical project called Homeworks, exploring what 19th century women writers teach us about being at home. She is currently collaborating on a poetry manuscript entitled Emily Dickinson in the 21st Century, Black Lives Matter, and we're looking forward to hearing more about that. Uh, I met Eric Johnson, actually. He reminded me um, at the MLA in 2016 in Austin when uh, I think I, I grabbed a ride with him <laughs> along with another scholar. And it's, it's just been a wonderful um, opportunity to invite him to, uh, to join us today. Eric Johnson is the Director of Digital Access at the Folger Shakespeare Library, where he heads the Digital Media and Publications Division. He manages the Folger's various digital initiatives and oversees the journal Shakespeare Quarterly and the Folger Shakespeare Editions series of Shakespeare's complete works. He is the creator of Open Source Shakespeare, one of the most widely used sites of its kind, and has written and spoken frequently about creating content-rich digital applications for Shakespeareans, early modernists, and general audiences. Eric holds an MA in English and a BA in history, and is a veteran of the US Marine Corps. So welcome to you both. And Ivy, go right ahead. Thank you, Elizabeth. I'm going to share my screen. And um, I just wanted to say that I dropped, uh, let me get this here. I dropped into the chat a, um, a list of all the links and resources that I'm going to refer to. Be, so you'll just have them and you don't have to you know, rush and write things down um, in case you wanted to. Um, 
to, to, to look at them and, and, and in them also are the poems that I'll be quoting from. So if you, if you get them in the chat, just open that up. Does everybody see that in the chat? Good, and everybody, everybody can hear me, yeah? Mm -hmm. Good, okay, so hold on, let me just. Uh... So my experience of teaching and research during the pandemic confirmed several important digital developments that I think will change our field going forward. The move to online teaching was challenging, as we all know, but it was facilitated by the many available digital resources like the invaluable EDA, the Dickinson Lexicon, the DEA, and my own digital labor of love, White Heat, Emily Dickinson in 1862, a weekly blog on the important themes in Dickinson's creative life. This is a blog that I created at, as part of my commitment to making digital humanities a public good. And that I think is one of the kind of central themes um, that I think is going to, to shape digital humanities um, in the coming, um, coming years. Because the pandemic revealed the sharp inequities in most of our cultural institutions from healthcare to housing to work and education foregrounding what we know, what we have known for a while that the 20th century knowledge project, which sustained modernity and is steeped in colonialism and imperialism is deeply flawed and needs to be rethought. And this includes its institutions like libraries, museums, the academy itself. I recommend um, the recent four part series from MIT and um, public books on the future of digital humanities. These are short essays. They have really wonderful links in them. The, the link is in that list of, of references that I gave you. Um, and I, and I, um, I'm quoting some of the uh, material in these links. So it's a really good kind of introduction. In her recent book, Generous Thinking, A Radical Approach to Saving the University, Kathleen Fitzpatrick argues that we need to rec recover the lost values of the university often housed in the humanities. She advocates rejecting the corporatizing of higher education and engaging in what she calls, quote, non-market relations of care that promote equity and inclusion, open access to knowledge and social justice. Digital humanities can play a crucial role in helping us reconfigure our teaching and our learning for the common good. For example, during the pandemic, I collaborated with three colleagues at Dartmouth on a digital project entitled Homeworks. Elizabeth mentioned it, um, and it's a wonderful project. It's, 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 we've just launched it recently. Um, and here are my, me and my four colleagues. We have a, a really lovely introductory video. Um, this website offers pedagogical tools and examples of student work for studying what 19th century women writers have to teach us about staying at home. Dickinson, as we know, was the queen of self-quarantine, but I wanted to use this as an opportunity to lift up other usually occluded voices with non-elite, especially non-Western experiences of home. So that in my module entitled Diverging Domesticities, I put Dickinson into conversation with two contemporaries, Lucy Larkham, a working class writer who started publish, publishing poetry as a tween worker in the Lowell textile mills, and Sarah Winnemucca, a member of and spokesperson for the Northern Paiute tribe who were forcibly removed by the US government from their ancestral homelands in what is now Nevada. So these women had a very different experience of home than for example, Emily Dickinson. But what does all this have to do with Shakespeare? who certainly does not lack for cultural airtime and can be construed as a colonizing force all on his own. There is a special power when our cultural icons reveal human possibilities that have been occluded or demeaned and thus speak to our contemporary moment in ways they and we could not imagine. 
My original idea for this talk was to create a white heat blog post on the theme of Dickinson's Shakespeare that would explore the subject historically, biographically, and poetically in a digitally hyperlinked format, which is what each one of the blog posts are. This would have been facilitated by the strong digital accessibility of Shakespeare's work. And for that, I recommend the Internet Shakespeare um, from the University of Victoria, British Columbia, which is a wonderful resource. And of also, I cannot get to it, uh, the Folger Library's um, wonderful um, and a, a resource. And I hope Eric will talk about that in his talk. To create this post, I began to read the most crucial critical work on Dickinson and Shakespeare, which has to be Parak Finnerty's encyclopedic study from 2006, Emily Dickinson's Shakespeare. Struck by the pervasive, not to say definitive influence of this poet on Dickinson, I recalled the one moment in advising a student's senior honors thesis on Dickinson when I suggested Shakespeare as an intertext. This was an exploration of the word bliss in fascicle 18, where I heard echoes of Shakespeare's devastating sonnet 129, which begins. Okay. Are we, are we good? Yeah. Okay. Okay. Which begins okay. the expense. Oh, I'm hearing other people talk, so I'm just wondering if. Oh, oh, okay. Um, which begins the expense of spirit in a waste Lord. of shame is. is lust in action. And that sonnet is in the, uh, in, in the um, document that I put in the chat. And then I fell down a rabbit hole chasing this lead and never created the post. In the messy process whose results I will share, I benefited from the many primary sources, which partly thanks to the pandemic are now online, making research and teaching the 19th century a much deeper and expansive endeavor. Digital rabbit holes are problematic because of what psychologists call confirmatory bias. That is, as you search, you're grabbed by an algorithm, which have been proven to be race and gender biased, and which offers you information confirming your point of view, thus digging us all deeper into the ideological rifts that divide us. To combat this, I try to embody what Stephen Ramsey calls and here's his essay, The Hermeneutics of Screwing Around or What You Do with a Million Books. My students love this essay and they love the title. Faced with the unthinkable amount of information on the web, Ramsey gives us permission, even urges us to just screw around, which he calls, quote, one of the most venerable techniques in the life of the mind. In my recent essay on teaching Dickinson, I gave this approach the more formal label of lateral thinking, a creative deferral of answers and solutions that produces what Ramsey, citing Roland Bark, calls, quote, the bliss of anarchy, of discovering what we did not already know. It produces, in Ramsey's words, a rather Dickinsonian, quote, practice of becoming, an invitation to community, relationship, and play. I'm really interested in this bliss because it is key in both Shakespeare and Dickinson. So Ramsey's screw minutical imperative, he calls it, also confirms one of Elizabeth Fitzgerald's striking aspects of generous thinking that could help us transform the academy, which is, quote, lingering with, with ideas that are in front of us rather than continually pressing forward to where we want to go. Thus, I want to linger with ideas about Dickinson and Shakespeare's sonnets that have been succinctly articulated by others, namely Judith Farr's speculation that the love triangle of, of the sonnets influenced Dickinson's love poetry, and Kristen Common's assertion in her 2001 essay entitled Dickinson's Body, Shakespeare and Sexual Symbolism and Emily Dickinson's Writing to Susan Dickinson, that, and this is Christ, Kristen Common's uh, conclusion, quote, Dickinson had a model of homoerotic love in Shakespeare's sonnets. Just a quick catch up for those of us not familiar with the sonnets. They were published in 1609 when Shakespeare retired 
to, in comfort to Stratford. Whether he authorized their publication is open to debate, but their arrangement in this first edition has generated a narrative about Shakespeare's love life that has caused scandal and endless discussion. That story goes something like this. The first 17 sonnets advise a beautiful high-born young man to marry and produce children. The next 109 sonnets urge the poet's love for him and claim that the poems will preserve his beauty and the poet's fame. The sequence concludes with 28 sonnets, two or about a seductive dark lady who ensnares the poet in an adulterous affair and further tortures him by taking up with the fair youth. These are the poet's, quote, two loves of comfort and despair from the famous sonnet 144. While critics and editors agree, and here I quote from the Folger introduction that, quote, the sonnets are only linked within specific clusters, that they were written perhaps over many years and perhaps two or about different people, and that only about 25 specify the sex of the beloved, unquote, the Folger editors conclude wearily, quote, such, such facts surrender to the narrative pull of the 1609 edition. Park Finnerty amplifies Comet's assertion in this 2008 essay, Queer Appropriations, Shakespeare's Sonnets and Dickinson's Love Poems, when he concludes, quote, Dickinson appropriates the sonnets, their mercantile and aristocratic imagery, their gender ambiguity, and their concern with time, waste, aging, and beauty to destabilize and complicate categories of gender and sexuality, and to question compulsory heterosexuality and the conventional relationship between identity and desire. That about says it all. But it's noteworthy that this essay was written after the book on Dickinson and Shakespeare, which only mentions the sonnets three times. One of these instances illustrates the problem I was sensing that sent me down this rabbit hole. Parak notes how many in the Dickinson circle own Shakespeare calendars, which offer daily quotations from his works. He finds that Sue and Emily commented on a quotation from Sonnet 43 about seeing in the dark, which he then astutely reads as an intertext, intertext for Dickinson's poem, What I See Not, I Better See. He reiterates the women's quote, often complex and intricate use of Shakespeare's lines to represent, articulate, and reconfirm aspects of their lives. Finding that Dickinson put bookmarks in her edition of Shakespeare, which he showed us yesterday, he concludes, quote, these homemade bookmarks would transform the family's Shakespeare into the poet's secret shrine and mark sites of personal significance in the plays, unquote. What jumped out at me here was how an example from the sonnets gets obscured by and folded into the effects of the more extensive and popular plays. Although the sonnets and the plays share imagery, themes, and poetic effects, they are quite different. The plays were meant to be performed, although we know that's not how Dickinson experienced them, and are a framework for group collaboration, different in every iteration. The sonnets were composed as poems, and though they create a dramatic narrative that unfolds over time, they are voiced by a speaker, a poet, who seems to speak in his own voice. I say seems because thanks to Virginia Jackson and also Adeline's wonderful talk uh, keynote yesterday, we're all aware of the politics of the lyric and Dickinson's own warning to Higginson that her poetic eye is a representative person. Parek's speculation about the dating of Dickinson's engagement with Shakespeare also beer, bears on the sonnets. He finds that Dickinson's references to Shakespeare in her letters occur mainly during the last 21st years of her life, concentrated in the final 10. There is a 12 year gap between 1853 and 1865 when she does not explicitly refer to Shakespeare in letters. Critics find references to Shakespeare in her poems quote, insignificant or irrecoverable. And I wonder if this is because they're looking for the plays and not the sonnets. In his subsequent essay on the influence of the sonnets, Parak explores many astonishing echoes and mostly in the poems of Dickinson's years of the white heat, that is 1861 and 63. And Elizabeth did the same thing yesterday in her marvelous talk. Here is where the benefits of accessing 19th century primary documents is invaluable. 
Browsing for Shakespeare criticism Dickinson might have read, I found a digital scan of a book by Anna Jameson, a widely read critic of Shakespeare titled Memoirs of the, Lo of the Loves of the Poets, published in Boston in 1831. In her chapter on Shakespeare, Jameson focuses exclusively on the sonnets because she claims, quote, the only writings he has left through which we can trace anything of his personal feelings and affections are his sonnets, unquote. However, in rejecting the claims circulating about homosexuality or perversion, Jameson imagines that many of the first 126 sonnets were really written to a woman and asserts of the whole, quote, they are full of the most exquisite feelings most felicitously expressed, unquote. In her admiration and autobiographical reading, Jameson is seconded by another later 19th century Shakespeare critic, critic Mary Cowden Clark, who in an essay titled Shakespeare as the Girl's Friend from 1883, holds Shakespeare up as a quote, grand aid for moral introspection, particularly for women, quote, since he, the most manly thinker and the most virile writer that ever put pen to paper, had likewise something essentially feminine in his nature, which enabled him to discern and sympathize with the innermost core of a woman's heart, unquote. While the remainder of the essay dwells on female characters in the plays, Clark continues, quote, witness his sonnets, where tenderness, patience, devotion, and constancy worthy of the gentlest womanhood are conspicuous in combination with a strength of passion and fervor of attachment belonging to manliest manhood. Clark's assertion of Shakespeare's androgyny is echoed by Virginia Woolf, who alludes throughout A Room of One's Own, 1929, to quote, Shakespeare's mind as the type of the androgynous, of the man-womanly mind, by which Wolf means, citing Coleridge's definition that, quote it, quote, it is less apt to make sexual distinctions than the single sex mind, is resonant and porous, it transmits emotion without impediment, it is naturally creative, incandescent, and undivided, unquote. A state of mind we can imagine Wolf and Dickinson aspiring to. And that state of mind is what I tried to imagine as I read the essay on Shakespeare's sonnet in the illustrated works of Shakespeare edited by Charles Knight, owned by the Dickinson family, and presumably read by Dickinson, which I accessed digitally through the Houghton Library. Um, and and it, that's an amazing resource, the fact that you can actually look at scans of this, of this um, edition. Knight begins his introduction by quoting Wordsworth, quote, scorn not the sonnet, critic, you have frowned, mindless of its just honors. With this key, Shakespeare unlocked his heart, unquote, essentially supporting the position that these are poems in which Shakespeare expresses his feelings in his own person. But to accept this is to embrace brace both the homoeroticism and self-abasement of the first 126 sonnets captured in the master mistress trope of sonnet 53 and the adultery and shame of the last 28 sonnets captured in sonnet 129. Characteristics of Shakespeare that led the critic Henry Hallam to conclude in his popular introduction to the literature of Europe 1837, quote, it is impossible not to wish that Shakespeare had never written them, unquote. To avoid this conundrum, Knight decided, quote, that though they are personal in their form, not all are necessarily personal of the sonnets. And furthermore, that Shakespeare could not possibly have overseen the arrangement of the 1609 edition, which offers the problematic immoral narrative triangle. So Knight declares that the sonnets, quote, were essentially a collection of fragments. He calls them stanzas and says that their arrangement was arbitrary because, quote, it violates the principles of art which Shakespeare clings to with such marvelous judgment in all his other productions. Knight then spends the next 50 plus pages, double columns, rearranging and reprinting the sonnets into three perfect little poems in which he, quote, counts 104 sonnets which are not offensive, unquote, and that in his mind now have internal continuity. He does not offer an explanation for the remaining 50 sonnets, 
or go as far as the 1840 edition of the sonnets, which changed the male pronouns of the beloved to female pronouns and gave the sonnets quaint titles. An addition, by the way, that became wildly popular, but night gets very close. Does this sound eerily familiar? After Dickinson's death, some of her poems and letters were mutilated, the names scratched out and the pronouns changed to cover up same sex desire. Her first editors ignored the order in which she arranged, arranged the poems in her 40 fascicles, dismembered them and rearranged them in groups with what they considered a continuity of themes and gave them quaint titles. Even R.W. Franklin considers the fascicles a matter of convenience, not artistic integrity. Of course, Dickinson could not have known this would happen to her poetry, but in Shakespeare's sonnets, she had a model of how even intelligent and influential readers like Jameson and Knight might respond to what Parrick calls poems of multiple eroticism that, quote, were a means of rethinking conventional categories that organize human desire and present gender disjunction that authorized and ennobled same-sex passion. And that's Parrick's conclusion. Finally, I imagine Dickinson agreed with Emerson that, quote, a foolish consistency is the hobglob goblin of little minds and recognized and rejected Knight's normalizing rearrangements as she would have resented those of Austin, Todd, and Higginson on her own poems. I think like Shakespeare in whose celebration of male homose homosocial desire, she found a model. She preferred the bliss producing technique of screwing around, which also, as we know, can produce waste and shame. Data mining the sonnets reveals the word waste appears 12 times, the word shame 14 times, and the word bliss once in sonnet 129, in which all three words appear to interact and deeply qualify each other. I think Dickinson responded to these word clouds when she wrote in poems she put into fascicle 18, for which I suggested sonnet 129 as an intertext, quote, is bliss then such abyss? And also, tis an instance play is a fond ambush just to make bliss earn her own surprise. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you all hear me? And can you see my screen? Just, if someone could nod, that would be great. Or shake me. <laughs> we can. Wonderful. Um, well, uh, thank you to the conference organizers for making this session possible. Uh, thank you to Elizabeth for organizing the session. And thank you to Ivy for setting me up uh, a number of points that I'm about to make. I, I lost count of about six. Uh, so um, this will be a, a uh, very coherent uh, panel today. Uh, my topic today is a comparison between the versions of Shakespeare that Emily Dickinson likely used and some of the Shakespeare versions that are available in the digital world today. Our time is limited, so this will be a quick tour, and I will include a couple of through lines that might or should be in of interest to all of you. I, I should start by saying, in case it isn't obvious, that I was not invited to speak here because of my deep knowledge of Emily Dickinson so I must beg your pardon in advance if I say anything amiss about her life or her works, and I trust you will gently correct me if I get anything wrong. For some perspective about Dickens and Shakespeare's, we should first talk about the editorial history of Shakespeare's works, which have been in print for 408 years so far and show no signs of abating. As you might expect, this will be a very general overview. This history can be roughly divided into three periods. There are the early printed versions, which came directly from Shakespeare's pen or from other manuscripts or from people's memory. The debate about how these works made it into print is a continued source of spirited debate. What is not debatable is that many of these plays have a complicated editorial history. And as the 17th century continued, 
readers began to ask questions about discrepancies within the texts. If they had access to multiple versions of the texts in quarto or folio format, they began to ask why some of them differed from each other. In some cases, this difference was rather stark. Dramatist and writer Nicholas Rowe produced the first modern edition of Shakespeare, which has the kind of features one expects when one buys an edition of Shakespeare today. He attempted to collate different versions of Shakespeare and produce what he believed to be a more coherent whole. This was necessary because by then, some plays had completely gone off the rails, at least in performance. The most notorious example was perhaps Nahum Tate's 1681 version of King Lear, which was changed to have a happy ending. Amazingly enough, it wasn't until around when Emily Dickinson was born that the original tra tragic ending was restored. Rowe himself was not a professional scholar. Indeed, none of Shakespeare's editors were scholars for over two and a half centuries. Giants such as Samuel Johnson, George Stevens, Alexander Pope, and Lewis Tibbald were variously lawyers, gentlemen, polymaths, eccentrics, and obsessives, but they were not professional academics. This picture changed when William Clark and William Wright of Cambridge University edited their landmark edition of Shakespeare from 1863 to 1866. This edition had two manifestations, the so-called Cambridge Shakespeare, published in nine volumes by Cambridge University Press, and the 1864 single volume Globe Shakespeare, published by Macmillan, a commercial publisher, and priced for average incomes of the time. The Globe Shakespeare was a runaway success, selling a quarter million copies. It quickly spawned imitators that were even lower priced. The market for Shakespeare in print was not an anomaly. As literacy in the Western world became more widespread during the 19th century, book prices have been dropping significantly. Access to literature was democratized and universalized. According to the Houghton Library's Guide to their collection of Dickinson family books, there appear to be six different editions of Shakespeare that Emily Dickinson might have had available to her. As you can see, the editions were eclectic published in single volumes and multiple volumes, covering single plays and the complete works and originating in England and America. Three of the six editions do not credit editors at all as if the texts were simply plucked as ideal forms from the literary ether. There were a finite number of editions in existence, so it would be possible to make up for the comparatively lax intellectual property protections of the time and name the actual editors. But it is telling that the artists who contributed the illustrations were credited more consistently than the editors who produced the texts. Illustrations were an essential feature of many editions. Iconographical representations of Shakespeare's plays were becoming common, such as Macbeth's Dagger and York's Skull. We can use the Dickinson's copy of The Merchant of Venice as an example of how contemporary editions of Shakespeare were created and marketed. In this case, the editor has decided to remove some unspecified number of lines quote, which in the present age might be thought objectionable, something that continues to the present day in performance. Readers did not have to use their imagination to picture the Piazza San Marco in Venice. They had only to open the book. Some of the illustrations blur the lines between print and theatrical presentation, depicting characters in copious detail st staged against evocative backdrops. They even brought in stage props, such as this lead casket, which plays a prominent role in the play. There are two other books in the Dickinson Library that make use of Shakespeare texts but are not actual editions. Mary Cowden Clark, uh, whom uh, Ivy mentioned earlier, uh, spent 16 years carving up the plays of Shakespeare into little bits and organizing them by word while producing her monumental concordance in 1845. The Dickinson's copy was printed in 1877 and was probably a later edition. Mrs. Cowden Clark was a fascinating feature in her own figure in her own right. She was an accomplished singer and actress, and her social circles included luminaries such as John Keats and Charles Dickens. She wrote and edited books and periodicals in her long life, and her concordance fed the creativity of other authors. There is this folded down corner, which we can see on page 153 of the digitized copy of the Dickinson concordance, with X marks next to three different passages under the cuckoo head. Could this be evidence that Emily Dickinson used the concordance in this poetry, in her poetry? There is the poem, uh, The Robins, My Criterion for Tune, which mentions the cuckoo prominently. And the concordance itself is clearly associated with Emily in this 1880 inscription by Susan Dickinson. However, the Houghton's date for the fascicle in which the poem appears is 1861. 
Unless the poem's date is wrong, Emily could not have possibly used this copy to compose the poem, and the Emily Dickinson Archive website returns no other results in a search for cuckoos. That said, even if there is no direct link between a particular play to a particular piece of evidence of use, the 1880 inscription from Susan to Emily indicates the concordance was used as a reference. It is also possible that Emily used a lost older copy of the concordance in previous years for previous works since the original edition came out in 1845. The other Shakespeare-related book in the Dickinson Library is the Shakespeare Birthday Book. This was less a reference than a ledger with a blank space for each of the 366 possible days. Family names were written into the spaces, much like births recorded in a family Bible. Unfortunately, the Dickinson copy is not digitized by the Houghton, so we cannot see, the, that, see Emily's name on December 10th, but they do have a digitized version of another copy, which is what you see here. The Shakespeare tie-in is on the opposite page where Shakespeare quotations appear. The first quotation seems appropriate to Emily. I hear, yet say not much, but think the more. The second quotation does not, unless Emily had demonic attributes with which I am unfamiliar. Even though it is a thoroughly derivative publication, the birthday book shows the ascendance of the Globe Shakespeare as it was proudly asserting its quotation's pro prominence, provenance from the Globe only 10 years after its first publication. Now we move on to the digital Shakespeare's of our own time, which are not wholly different from the digital Shakespeare's of the Dickinson family's time. Sorry, the printed Shakespeare of Dickinson family's time. Uh, the Moby Shakespeare electronic texts were created in the 1990s by a computer scientist named Brady Ward, who was working on a linguistic project that had nothing to do with Shakespeare whatsoever. He used the corpus of the complete works as raw materials for his project, along with a range of other sources. Ward eventually released the texts and the results of the Moby project into the pu public domain in 1996. The edition on which he based his electronic uh, Shakespeare text was The Globe Shakespeare. The Globe's text has been published in other editions throughout most of the 20th century. Indeed, in its decades long afterlife, it continued to be a seminal, seminal reference in classroom edition. Moby Shakespeare made its way onto a web server at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1993. It is one of the oldest Shakespeare sites in the World Wide Web, dating back to when people used to call it the World Wide Web. The texts themselves are primitive and the site shows no sign of being updated since the year 2000. Despite its lack of modern features, it is likely one of the most popular Shakespeare sites on the web, if not the most popular. And not in the past, but today. It shows up consistently as one of the top Google search results for Shakespeare related queries. And so it probably gets at least as much traffic as the next site we will discuss. I created open source Shakespeare from 2003 to 2005 as a project to complete my MA degree in English at George Mason University. I also created it out of my frustration with other Shakespeare resources that were available on the internet back then for their inaccuracy and lack of functionality. The electronic texts were taken from Moby Shakespeare as those texts were well-structured and reasonably clean. I created a, a, a parsing program to read all the texts in the database, which allowed a number of functions to be built on top of it. The advanced search function allows users to search using a variety of criteria. This was one of two functions that established open source Shakespeare as a primary research tool for many students and scholars. The other is the concordance. You'll remember from a few moments ago that it took 16 years for Mary Cowden Clark to complete her concordance. Once I had the basic site built, I was encouraged by several people to build a concordance function. Although I was originally skeptical that very many people would want to use it, I spent an entire week creating it. I would love to say that this efficiency was because of some flash of genius on my part, but it had almost everything to do with the nature of electronic databases. Concordances, like other types of reference works, were just waiting for computers to be invented because once texts have made their way into, electro into electronic formats, they are endlessly manipulable. The USS Concordance turned out to be a very strong success. In the year 2020, it received over 274,000 interactions. And for many conversations with scholars, I know that this is probably the most appreciated set of features on the site. OSS also shows evidence of use. It has logged millions of searches and it is possible to see the number of times certain words have been searched. You will likely be pleased to know that when it comes to keyword searches, love triumphs over hate by a very wide margin. The last example of digital Shakespeare is the Folger Shakespeare editions, uh, which I have queued up for me here. 
Um, these were originally uh, published in the 1950s and the uh, format in print has continued since then with text on the right, explanations on the left and images drawn from the Folgers collection interspersed throughout. There's a second version of the Folger Shakespeare, which began in 1992 uh, and has appeared in print in the next two decades uh, and is still in print today. We believe it is the most popular version of Shakespeare in North America. Uh, it contains the complete works, including the, the sonnets and other poems. I uh, should note, this is not based on the globe. Uh, these are new editions that draw from modern scholarship. In 2012, uh, we worked out a, an agreement with our publisher, Simon & Schuster, to release the unadorned, unglossed uh, texts of Shakespeare freely on the web for non-commercial uh, non purposes. This is the most successful attempt to uh, challenge the globe Moby dominance of the online Shakespeare realm. It hewed very closely to the format of the page, retains uh, a line, the line numbering of the books, and then has a separate through line numbering system, uh, which you can see on, on the left in this uh, retired version of the Polar Digital Text site. And we expanded into other media. We had, uh, we released recordings of seven full cast uh, productions, audio productions of, uh, from our, our professional theater company uh, of the uh, seven of the most popular plays of Shakespeare, which you can I get from all the usual, usual sources where you can get uh, recorded books. And in 2016, uh, e-readers e had evolved to the point where it was finally worth it for us to release glossed versions of the e-books that, uh, that, 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 uh, that we offer. So it is now possible to jump um, from the text to the footnotes in a, in a very uh, seamless sort of way, which was not pos possible for them, and all of the, the books are available as ebooks in that format. And last year, we released a new version of the Folger Digital Text site, which we are now just simply calling Folger Shakespeare, as we are calling all of our other uh, related media. Um, this has the same text with expanded functionality and a new interface, which is optimized for a reading, a good reading experience. In the end, Folger Shakespeare is software, a collection of electronic media. This media collection emanates through the printed page, audio recordings, and images. As such, it is the first Shakespeare edition, which is truly taking advantage of the affordances that the information age gives us. But it must be said that Emily Dickinson's works are software too. I was able to complete all the research for this presentation using digital media from a variety of sources, which were mediated by various software layers, because it turns out that all literature is software that finds its expression in media. And this has always been true, but that is a topic for another day. Thank you kindly for your attention. That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for that uh, discussion of resources. Um, we have about five minutes. Um, I want to invite now everyone to um, if they wish, ask questions or make comments, you can raise your hand in the participants uh, panel, your, your virtual hand or your natural hand. I can try to, to see that as well, but the, the raised hand would be better uh, in participants. And KH, our co-host, will also be, I think, keeping an eye out for people who will be asking questions. And I saw even some discussion in the chat, so you may want to, you may want to um, repeat that also for Ivy and Eric since they were busy giving their papers. Comments, questions. Yes. Okay. So Elizabeth, go ahead. I just wanted to say thank you to Ivy and Eric for two really rich, terrific presentations and um, and really complimentary to many of the other terrific talks we've heard here. And I'm excited to talk so much more with you, Ivy, now. And I, I'm really excited about that, the bliss discovery. I don't know if Dickinson would have known. I doubt it. And I don't, and I'm pretty sure you did not see this in the, in the night 
introduction to the sonnets, I'm sure not, but there was a, a very widespread belief in the 16th, early 17th century that every orgasm shortened a man's life by a day. So the expensive spirit in a waste of shame um, has, an, has an extra, um, it's really loaded, we could say. <laughs> um, but I just wanted to thank you both and thank Eric for um, for working on these resources, which you have no idea how useful, how helpful through through so many years they have been to my teaching and my research. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's gratifying to hear that. And um, yeah, we know that, that, that uh, these resources are, are used widely uh, in, in, in classrooms, actually particularly over the last year and a half because of the, the pandemic. Uh, we've mm -hmm. seen the usage numbers that have uh, dwarfed anything that we've seen in, in the past. So, but thank you very much. For sharing. Uh, Martha Nell, do you have a question? Ivy is saying something. I know, I wanted to just say something to Eric. Um, I just checked the concordance on the open source Shakespeare, which I didn't know about somehow, and it's so helpful. So thank you so much for, for spending that week and producing it because um, I, I, I don't know, but I immediately go to the, con the, right. the concordances and, and, and love to see where those words are used. And, and, and so, it, it's, so that's a great resource. Sorry, Martha Nell, go ahead. No, that's okay. I mean, I will keep this very brief. First, I want to thank you both. Uh, Eric, thank you so much for compiling all those resources, sharing them with us. Uh, I'm a geek for concordances, so thank you very, very much again for that. And Ivy, I, I love what you're focusing on with the sonnets, and I, real I uh, liked that you drew on Chris's comments by the uh, essay. And I thought you pulled some things very deftly. So I'm just making comments and reminding some people of what you said, but I think that that essay has not gotten as much attention as it deserves, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Did I freeze or did y'all freeze? Anyway, and I'm, I'm going to uh, ask you to send me your paper because I kept getting interrupted while you were talking, Ivy, and I apologize. <laughs> yeah, and it was such a, a, a rich list of resources that both papers presented. I'm wondering yes. if we might actually be able to compile that list and post it somewhere on the website. I mean, both of you did an extraordinary amount of spade work there that we shouldn't have to reproduce, that we should have at the ready for use for students and um, our own research alike. So I would like to follow up with both of you, if that's okay. We Other... could add a resources link to yes. this conference. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. We could add it a couple of places. Well, I also wanted to just um, second Eric's feeling is, you know, being able to find these essays by Mary Cowden Clark or Jameson or these books, the, the loves of the poet. I mean, you can find these books now uh, that are that are scanned and digital and they're on the web. So yeah. we can ask our students to do these really rich deep dives into the what we call the print environment of of Emily Dickinson's moment. Yeah. Which we couldn't do before. And so it, it's really there for us to use that those those um, resources. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Melba, well, I think you had a, I'm sorry, Eric, go ahead, respond if you want. I was, was going to uh, piggyback on what, what I think you said, <coughs> excuse me, which is um, more students that get involved uh, that are trying to do the, make the comparison between the evidence of use and the poems themselves, the more likely you are to, to, to turn things up, you know, having more pairs of eyes. Right on these right. things will we'll, we'll, uh, force more possibilities. Maybe they won't all come up with uh, strong connections, but they will certainly increase the number of, of uh, possible connections that could be examined. So that, that, that's a very exciting prospect. If I may say so, having more pairs of eyes turned on resources is so important and comparing what is seen. Um, I became a big believer in that in working on editing, you know, and one of the things that can be very productive is when the pairs of eyes see different things and even contradictory things. And that that kind of dissensus can be so productive and insightful. Right. Dissonance is productive. It can <laughs> as be. It were. Or dissonance, um, yeah. Let's let's turn to Melba. Melba, did you have a comment? We can go a couple of minutes over. 
Sorry, Elizabeth, I was just trying to applaud posting the list of resources. Okay, and we will follow up on that. I think that's a really helpful, okay. um, helpful thing to do. Uh, other comments or questions for our panelists? They were such rich talks and gave us so much to think about. And the reading of the sonnets was, was really wonderful um, with the use of intertext and Eric also, you're providing us so many ways to really intersect between um, you know, Shakespeare's materials that are available online with um, what we already have available for Emily Dickinson.